Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. Las Vegas, Nevada, the entertainment capital of the world. Millions of people flock here each and every year, drawn by its bright lights and glamour, but also the chance to win big. People can lose themselves in Sin City and often go home with far less than they brought with them. Often referred to as America's playground and the capital of second chances. People come here to forget their worries and to let loose. As the old saying goes, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Or does it? shooting everybody and there was dead people everywhere. We have an active shooter. We have an active shooter inside the fairgrounds. A devastating national tragedy in Las Vegas claiming 58 lives and leaving hundreds injured. We do not still have a clear motive or reason why. Hello and welcome to I Could Murder a Podcast. I'm Tom and this is my good pal, Ben. How are you, mate? You all right? Yeah, not bad, thanks, Ben. How are you doing? <laughs> That's how people talk. That's how humans... Yeah, not that bad. <laughs> That's how, human... how are you doing? That's how humans communicate. <laughs> anyway, anyway, what are we doing here today? What is our, what is our goal with the podcast? Um, well, I think, uh, number one, let's just have fun. Yeah, I, would just have a... I would like to have fun. <laughs> More oil, please. <laughs> I yeah. was just learning to, to love. love harmony. That was... <laughs> right, we have to keep going with this because we've caught that now. Uh, All right. Speaking of catching things, um, we've caught the true crime bug. <laughs> <coughs> I like that, but didn't like the sniff. I'll probably get rid of the sniff. No, because it. I sound yeah, but more. No one wants to hear. Infected sn- with that bug. Yeah. They're cool. So what we've been good pals, we've figured out 13 years now. On the dot. Get less for murder. Well, do you? <laughs> Let's talk about it. Let's investigate. When we discovered um, probably a few years now, we both are really into true crime and, really? and murder. Sharing podcasts, sharing articles. <clears throat> I think we got really into it just as it become kind of the cool thing. I think do. I got just before it, I think I got into it just before it was cool. Yeah. You kind of got into it a little bit later. Well, I was more finding like un- underground crimes, like, you know, the indie, like indie indie sort of crimes, you know. Give me one indie crime. Um, the kooks. <laughs> I was thinking the kooks. <laughs> Luke Pritchard, um, wearing those jeans. <laughs> it's criminal. Um, no, for us, I think, I, I think we're both kind of morbidly curious. Yeah. Um, I think there's a certain, I think all the cases that we're going to, to do deep dives into are ones that make me feel slightly anxious. So let me put myself in the shoes of an audience member. Um, what crimes are you going to pick? How are you picking them? Mm-hmm. Um, any teasers? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's not just uh, crimes that we're going to be uh, diving into. We're going to look at some mysteries, Ooh. some conspiracy theories. I mean, some of them are a mixture, a blend, a hybrid of all three. And we're not just going to be doing murderers, are we? We're going to also look at cases of just offenders in some element of sexualized behavior. That's what we yeah, that's... Sexual offenders. Sorry. There you go. What we're hoping to come up with or what we're aiming to come up with is some uh, some bingeable deep dive content. I mean, some some people want to be rich, some people want to be famous. I just want to be binged. Sounds disgusting. I want to be binged. Yeah, binge binge watched. Huh? Before we get into it, I want to say a quick thank you to Phil Witten for doing the animations and all the kind of branding and Alfie Indra for the, for the theme music. Both of them were a pleasure to work with and hit the brief bang on. Chef's kiss. And all of their information will be down below mm-hmm. and we'll be tagging them in multiple things going forward. So please be sure to follow them and keep up with what they're doing. They're both incredibly talented lads. Awesome. Really, really awesome artists. So Ben, you wanted to start the podcast covering the Las Vegas shooter. Do you want to get into some details why you wanted to start with that? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, we, we shortlisted a few different cases between us, but this to me was the one that I really, I was, I was just drawn to. 
So on a personal level, I was actually there three days after what we're going to discuss um, took place. Um, so it's really, really eerie. We obviously went to uh, the Mandalay Bay. We went within the casino. We went outside, saw the windows still kind of boarded up, saw the fairgrounds of the, of the Las Vegas village. Um, was the vibe of, um, was, it, was it drastically different to the previous time she'd been there? <clears throat> um, no, that's the weird part. So we went we went obviously up. So they, they made basically um, between the Mandalay Bay where the shooter was and then uh, Las Vegas village where the festival was, you basically have the big Las Vegas sign um, and they'd made like a kind of um, off the cuff interim tribute there for, for all the victims. And apart from the spending some time literally at the tribute site, the rest of the, the rest of the city, they, we had a taxi driver um, that told us nothing will stop the party, which was, yeah. it was a weird way to frame it. The, the case itself is, is a really interesting one. Um, so it still to this day has no clear motive. There are plenty, plenty of conspiracies. Which attached. I'm sure we'll go into. Of course we will. Of course we will. So st- stick around. But um, um, no, I think uh, the shooter himself, obviously really, really interesting guy. Um, at the same time, kind of boring, if that but, even yeah, works. Weirdly, the bo- how boring he is makes him more intriguing. Exactly, yeah. I, um, he's kind of your run of the... I wouldn't say run of the mill, but um, he's very wealthy, obviously. Um, but, so uh, run of the millionaire. That's good stuff. That's good squishy. Um but no, he um, he was very methodical. Obviously, he was a, a gambler. We'll get into some more detail about him shortly. But um, he's not. Uh, yeah, he was not your typical mass shooter, mass murderer type uh, individual, which is kind of what makes this case even more fascinating. All right. Well, let's get into it. Let's do it. So let me set the scene. It is approximately 10 p.m. on October 1st. You're having the time of your life in Las Vegas at the Route 91 Harvest Country Music Festival. It's been a weekend full of music, good times, cold beer and fun. Headline act Jason Aldean takes the stage and is now closing the show with his hit song, When She Says Baby. Over the beat of the drum and the chugging guitars, you begin to hear firecrackers. The stage and surrounding casinos illuminated. You think that maybe the fireworks are about to start. It's Vegas after all. The lights go out, the smell of gunpowder fills the air, but the fireworks are nowhere in sight. Something isn't right. Aldine flees the stage and panic ensues. The sounds of country music are replaced by shouting and screaming, alongside volleys of what you can only assume is rapid gunfire. Crowds begin to flee and fall as bullets rain down from the sky. With echoes ringing out through the Las Vegas Strip, survival instinct kicks in. Some choosing to run, some choosing to hide, some choosing to shield wounded loved ones. The bullets do not stop. Many more continue to fall, A sound of sirens joins the chaotic symphony as police and ambulance crew rush to the scene. Unbeknownst to the world at the time, the conductor of the Western Hemisphere's deadliest mass shooting was safely perched in the darkness of his 32nd floor Mandalay Bay suite, spraying thousands of bullets onto the innocent men, women and children below. So the big question is, how did the 64-year-old former millionaire find himself barricaded in on the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Hotel with thousands of dollars worth of guns? I mean, it looks like he spent months and months and months, maybe years worth of, of planning uh, going into this event, certainly in the weeks building up. But uh, when you actually look at him on paper, there's there's not a lot. There's not a lot there. I mean, he didn't leave any kind of uh, social media footprint. There was it was really hard to track down any information uh, about him. It was this is it's just very mysterious, kind of keeping himself to himself type of character. So going back and going through his family history, on the surface, it looks like there's no real red flags. There's nothing too crazy about it. Apart from the fact his dad was um, one of the um, on the FBI's most wanted list, uh, he was a bank robber. He got got caught, but then he did escape from prison um, and was on the run. So growing up, lacking a real father figure, him being notorious for being a, a high end criminal, mm-hmm. um, you can't help but think that that might have um, affected the way he grew up and the way he thought about things. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine going to school being the son of a bank robber or the son of someone that's on the the FBI's top 10 most wanted list? Like, you either take that as something to brag about or you take that as something to very much keep keep to yourself, keep quiet. So according to one of Stephen Paddock's ex-wives, he said to her, growing up without a dad, he learned to be self-reliant and, um, you know, very independent because um, they didn't have a lot of money in the house. So he learned growing up that he has to look after himself. 
Yeah, I read um, I read a similar article actually. It was from the Sun, uh, and it was from an anonymous sex worker. But obviously, when events like this uh, do happen, you get all sorts of people coming out of the woodwork. Oh, I knew him. This is so out of character for him. Or I knew him, and I knew he was bad. And I knew he was going to do something like this. But uh, this anonymous sex worker who claims to have spent um, had a bit of a fling with Paddock over three or four months, the early part of 2017, claimed that. Um, he would bring up his dad quite a lot, but in a kind of bragging fashion. So he would okay. mention that, although, yes, in my childhood, I didn't have any interactions with my dad. Um, you know, he was a bad guy, but I have bad guy's blood in me and uh, I have a bad streak about me as well. So it's really interesting to to, to read kind of the, the relationship he had with his father. And obviously there was, uh, he has three other siblings, there's four altogether. Yes, he's, he's the oldest of, of four. Um, and they're all boys, aren't they? Yeah. They're all guys, yeah. So going on that, um, he said about growing up and he had bad blood, he had a bad streak in him. He never really uh, did anything in his past, had trouble with the law. The only information I could find about any kind of previous um, insight to his criminal background was that he had a couple of uh, run-ins with the police about traffic violations. That was it. So I don't know if that's for parking he, offences, speeding. And he also tried to sue some company for, for falling over in there. It was a casino. It was one of the casinos. Yeah, so he was um, a pretty, re- you know, in his adulthood, he was a pretty regular figure. He was well known. He was um, somewhat of a high roller as well. But he wasn't a whale, and a whale is the term used for extreme high rollers. Extreme high rollers. He was like... Um, a pike? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that a big enough fish? Well, a very, yeah, yeah, compared to a whale, I think that's a good... A good... Or a dolphin. Oh, dolphins are lovable, it can't be that. What's... An eel. He was an eel of a man. Yeah, he had a fall. I believe it was in one of the MG. I could be completely wrong, but one of the MGM owned casinos, and he he, he um, sued them because he slipped. But he didn't win the case. Didn't win the case. No. This is quite interesting as well. Um, so although he wasn't referred to as a whale, he still he was an eel. We've... As a, sorry. So this eel. <laughs> Uh, slipped along the strip and uh, he uh, was alleged to have gambled between $10,000 to $30,000 a day. A day, whoa. And if that don't make you a whale, then can you imagine? Because he found, um, he got into a, a real estate, he made his millions at one stage. Um, I That's think right. He was alleged he was actually worth between five and six million dollars. Wow. Because, um, yeah, he helped one of his brothers retire early, completely. Um, made his mum kind of able to, you know, very comfortable, but also made her retirement very comfortable. So the only extra information I had is that um, he was twice divorced. You mentioned, obviously, one of his exes. Um, former auditor. He also worked for the Postal Service. Um, he was an accountant and a real inst- a real estate investor. Um, the real estate's where he made his real <clears throat> millions. Obviously, accountants are very well paid as well, but real estate was where he cleaned up. Well, and then obviously he made quite a bit, although there's different stories leading up to the incident. Um, He made a fair amount of money from gambling, like to that, to to him, the casinos will will work for him as well. That's probably what he told himself to help him. It's work, baby. (laughs) I'm going to Vegas for a week. It's work, baby. He, um, his brother, it's a really, if you get the chance to check it out, um, Eric Paddock, the brother, they they interview him and um, he referred to it as like imagining... He was, you know, over in Japan working in the Toyota factory. And they have, obviously, employees' housing built right next to the family. So they just leave the um, leave the house, go to work. And that's how he referred to his work at Vegas when he was gambling. So he'd just go into the casinos, make some money. But then also associated with all the, the comps he got as, a, as an eel, as the high roller. So... Um, the he eel was getting, deal. He, the, he was the eel deal, indeed. So he was getting... Um, He's getting comped meals, comped uh, rooms, you know, loads of uh, access to different events and, and concerts and shows. And his chosen, his chosen um, betting game was? Video poker. It's the loneliest of gambling forms. Yeah, because he, he wasn't a, really a people person from what I can gather. He, he, no. he, um, he, would, he would gamble during the night because yep. he didn't like to be up in the, in the sun and in the heat. He would gamble throughout the whole, the whole night. Um, so uh, Paddock also had a long-term Filipino girlfriend. Um, she was actually a hostess at the Atlantis Casino over in Reno, Nevada, which is about seven hours from Vegas. Um, now, the interesting thing about her is that she had stated months leading to the attack that 
Paddock and her had stayed in a similar suite at the Mandalay Bay. During their stay, he was repeatedly casing out the Las Vegas village uh, from different window points in the hotel. How weird is that? It's one of the things, I guess, whilst they're doing it, you just think they're just looking out a window. But once you start knowing all the things to emerge afterwards, then you really have put context on it. He also then wired $100,000 to his girlfriend the week before the shooting. So she was actually over in the Philippines at the time. He'd paid for a flight for her to go back and see her family. Wired over um, uh, large sums of money over a period of time, which I think we're going to break a, a bit of a time frame down uh, together. But there was no explanation. She actually thought that he was doing this to break up with her. But uh, I don't know how she's been broken up with before. But. Yeah. Uh, Dump me. <laughs> but it is alleged as well that um, while he was in different uh, casinos or if he was in restaurants within the casinos, he would talk down to her quite a bit. Okay. So he, he always paid for everything. So apparently um, he was um, getting a coffee uh, within within one of the resorts. And um, again, this is an anonymous source said that uh, he had said, I pay for everything just like I pay for you. So one of the things that have emerged since the case is the fact that he didn't just pick this festival he actually had gone to a lot of festivals previously running up to it which people aren't sure whether or not he was going to these festivals to maybe actually perform the acts he wanted to do or he was casing it out seeing how securities ran seeing how many people would be in what spaces at what times um what what festivals did he actually wreck you out look at so yeah, so that's true. That so he'd um, he'd researched large scale events over in Boston, um, which I believe is the other side of America. Um, he had also reserved a room overlooking the August 2017 Lollapalooza Festival, which was in Chicago. So he's, he's not just focusing on Vegas. However, this is kind of weird. He um, from September seventeenth. Uh, through to the 24th of September, he'd stayed in the Ogden, um, which is a hotel in downtown Las Vegas, and that actually overlooked the Life is Beautiful uh, music festival. Um, and and uh, But obviously nothing nothing happened there. So one of the big things, when I, because I didn't know much about the case until I did research about it, the one of the things that stood out for me is the fact that how much, how many guns he was able to bring into the room, how many bags he was just able just to bring in. Do you think... One of the reasons he was able, obviously, one of the reasons he was able to do that was because the casino were familiar with him. Mm-hmm. Do you think perhaps the reason why the other festivals he wasn't, he didn't do it there was because he wouldn't have a relationship with those hotels? If he's trying to bring that much ammunition and, and guns, they would smell a rat essentially. Yeah, I think. Well, well, I, yeah, I don't know which which casinos he did and didn't have relationships with. I mean, he was fairly well known throughout Vegas, but uh, Mandalay Bay was one that he stayed in regularly, regularly, regularly. So. Um, for him to get the number of bags, I think it was uh, 22 different mm. bags over the period of a week, which we'll go into some uh, some more detail on. Um, yeah, he had a very, very good relationship with the people at the, the Mandalay Bay. Um, frequent high roller there, um, gambled a lot of money there. So I think he's just a familiar face. He's viewed as exactly the way we described him, interesting but boring, kind of just uh, he would blend into a crowd type yeah. of character. So he's slipping the bellboys some money, going away, changing clothes, coming back with a new bag, different bellboy. It, 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 you can see how it's done, but also it's crazy that... Because once, so once he checked in, he checked in with his normal bags, and then during that time, because he, he was there for a week before the festival? Yeah, so he, he, um, he checked in on um, September 25th, which is, I believe, yeah, almost exactly a week before, uh, before the... Um, Shooting. So he he then did multiple trips back to his house to get more bags, more ammunition, more guns. Mm-hmm. Um, but as you said, he's changed his clothes. People, different people are working at the time. Um, walking through, if you see the security cameras and security footage, it's such a busy floor that it's quite easy for you just to slip by and not be noticed. Yeah. So he was uh, so well known and so kind of viewed as so prominent that he was also allowed access to one of the staff elevators. And uh, they took his bags up that way as well, which apparently is never done. Yeah. So uh, yeah, he amassed that over the period of a week, and uh, by October first, he was he was ready to go. I mean, he had all of his computer gear as well, um, all the ammunition as well as the weapons. Just a crazy amount of gear. Um, it's really yeah, it's it's eerie that he was able to to stoke that up. But then in Vegas as well, like a big thing, is uh, people go on golfing trips. 
so it's quite easy just to look like you're carrying a golfing bag or you're 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 you're, you're up to something. So um, you can kind of see why it wasn't questioned at the same time. But it's just uh, yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think that would happen now. Because what was found what was found on his computer afterwards as well? There was some interesting things he was googling and researching whilst he was there. Yeah, and th- so this is really weird because already in his mind he knows the end result. Mm. So his searches were, um, he, he had searched for SWAT weapons, um, ballistics chart 308, essentially a long-range trajectory um, view. So from firing from a height, what will then happen to your bullet? And it will okay. gradually kind of do an, like a lowercase n shape. SWAT Las Vegas and do police use explosives? So, I mean, he's preparing for the end. Yeah. There. He knows whatever happens once once he starts uh, once he starts firing, that is uh, his outcome. He was a very studious guy, and he, anything he got involved in, he'd, he'd completely get obsessed with it. So, mm-hmm. I think toward the end, he was just doing all the research he possibly could to make that a success. I hate using the phrase success, but yeah. obviously, he was out to did what he was out to do essentially mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then and that's kind of shown in kind of the, the the amount of money he gambled like i mean he was a calculated guy so he would only pick certain machines and gamble on those i mean the fact that he he viewed gambling as a job shows he wasn't a very a very fun guy he he, he sucked the fun out of everything and just made it into work yeah yeah i mean the only thing i can think to argue that point with was that um his brother, uh, Eric, who's the one that gave all those interviews out, and he's clearly in like a state of shock. But he talked about he'd be the fun uncle for his kids to go and see in Vegas because he's a guy that lives in casinos and they yeah. go out for all these fancy meals and they ate a thousand dollars worth of sushi in one sitting or something because he got all of this for free. But at the same time, yeah, you just, um, I know he doesn't, he, yeah, even when you know they released photos of him and that, they, they, it was hard. They were hard pressed to find any images of him. I mean, yeah. he's just a really reclusive guy. Well, even on the Wikipedia, they've got a picture of him with his eyes closed. You, <laughs> you would have thought, out of all the pictures you possibly get, there's other there'd be other photos of him. Yeah, but um, and it's heavily cropped as mm. well, which I love. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to go through a bit of a, uh, a time timeline now. And kind of break this down together, really give a clear picture of uh, of the days leading up to the attack. This is provided by the Los Angeles Times, if you want to play along. Um, <laughs> so September 25th, Paddock checks into the hotel with a checkout date of October 2nd. He rolls one bag to the room himself, and a bellman uses a luggage cart to bring up four other bags. Then Paddock leaves and returns to his home in Mesquite, Nevada. Uh, so the following day, September 26th, Paddock wires $50,000 to a bank account in the Philippines where his girlfriend Marilu Danley is visiting family. Paddock then returns to Las Vegas and visits a pair of casino hotels before returning to the Mandalay Bay, where he brings another six suitcases on a luggage cart, as well as another rolling suitcase to his room. Paddock then begins to gamble at the hotel overnight and into the next morning for more than eight hours. September 27th, Paddock insists on relocating to another room, said he wants a better view, and he is given a suite with two adjoining rooms. That night, Paddock drives back to Mesquite and buys luggage, razor blades, fake flowers, a vase, and styrofoam ball at Walmart. Razor blades, fake flowers, a vase, and a styrofoam ball. What's going to happen there? A blue Peter. September 28th, Paddock buys a bolt action rifle from a gun store in Mesquite and wire transfers an additional $50,000 to an account in the Philippines. Paddock also goes to a gun range before returning to Las Vegas. He brings another two rolling suitcases and a laptop bag to his Mandalay Bay room and again gambles for more than six hours until the early morning. So I think we're up to 10 bags now, I think. Should do a little uh, bag count. Like, bop, bop, bop. September 30th, after spending September 29th mostly in his room, Paddock places Do Not Disturb signs on his adjoining rooms, drives to Mesquite, returns to his Mandalay Bay suite with four more suitcases. He then drives back to Mesquite. October 1st, the day of the attack, Paddock returns to Mandalay Bay early in the morning and gambles for four hours. He brings two more rolling suitcases and a bag to his room. And throughout the afternoon, officials say he is detected opening and closing the doors to his suite multiple times, probably while preparing for his attack. Okay, so this is the day of the attack, so now we're just in it by time. 9.36pm, 
Paddock deadbolts the door to one of his rooms and then deadbolts the door to the other one 10 minutes later. 10 p.m. Security guard Jesus Campos arrives via elevator on the 32nd floor to investigate an alert of an open door in a guest's room down the hall from Paddock's suite. Campos checks a stairwell door that blocked his entry to the floor minutes earlier and discovers that it has been fastened closed with an L bracket. 10.04pm, Campos calls security dispatch to report the blocked door. His call is routed to the facility's maintenance department, which dispatches maintenance engineer Stephen Shuck to go to the floor. 10.05pm, Paddock fires two initial shots at the Las Vegas Village, the open-air venue across the street from the hotel where the Route 91 Harvest Music Festival is being held, with more than 20,000 attendees. Then he fires more. 10.06 p.m. Campos hears what he later described as rapid drilling noises as Paddock fires about 100 rounds at concert goers. Paddock, who has placed surveillance cameras outside his room, starts shooting through his door and down the hallway at Campos, hitting the security guard in the leg. Campos, who is unarmed, takes cover and radios a hotel dispatcher for help, giving Paddock's room number on the 32nd floor. 10.07 p.m. Paddock resumes firing hundreds of rounds at concert goers. Two Las Vegas police officers are already in the building on another call. They head upstairs, presumably to try and find the source of the gunfire, along with two armed Mandalay Bay security guards. Over the next two minutes, Paddock takes several pot shots at jet fuel storage tanks at a nearby airport, striking them twice but not igniting the fuel, before resuming fire on the concert crowd. 10.10pm, Shuck, the building engineer, arrives on the 32nd floor and Campos yells for him to take cover. Paddock starts firing down the hallway and Shuck radios hotel dispatch to send police to the 32nd floor. 10.11pm, the two police officers arrive on the 31st floor, one floor below Paddock's, as the gunman resumes firing on the concert crowd. 10.12pm, two armed Mandalay Bay security officers arrive on the 32nd floor and the police and security officers on the 31st floor realise that the shooting is coming from one floor above them. 10.15pm, Paddock fires his final shots at concert goers roughly 10 minutes after initiating fire. 10.16pm, the two police officers on the 31st floor enter the stairwell outside the 32nd floor hallway but do not confront Paddock. 10.57pm, police breach the sealed 32nd floor stairwell doorway. 11.20pm, police use explosives to blow up Paddock's door and they discover him dead. 11.26pm, Police breach the interior door to Paddock's second room, where a police officer accidentally fires three rounds into the room. I don't think they needed to say that last bit. It just makes it's just embarrassing (laughs) the police. Yeah, I mean, well, it could have been anything though. He might have thought um, he saw something. Maybe I mean, he'd smashed windows in each room, so maybe the curtain Mm. was, you know, the kind of. Because by that stage, they didn't know it was just one guy, did they? They thought it could possibly be exactly. Yeah. Well, everyone in the crowd and multiple witnesses have come come forward to say there were multiple shooters, multiple shooters. But Vegas is a is a city where there's constant flashing lights. It's a big open space as well where he, he was shooting down on them. So there was echoes, obviously. Um, and and to this day, he's he's the only shooter that has been uh, kind of yeah, proven they, to have have uh, participated. There in was the calls to the dispatches about Tropicana Hotel. So they're saying that there was shooters coming from there. Obviously, that's what people thought. So, um, but the police had to go there and check that out, as well as as everything yeah. else going on. Um, the the thing about the strip as well, though, is because the, I mean, where the Mandalay is, it's right at the, at the what I would call the top of the strip where it ends. But as you go down into deeper parts of the strip, where where did you say Tropicana? So it's on the opposite side, but it's still right in the middle. It's just skyscrapers the whole way down, so you you, you would it would echo the whole way yeah. down. Um, but yeah, at the time there were reports of um, yeah multiple active shooters. Yeah, if like me, uh, you have slight weird interest in terms of what prisoners have for their last meals. Paddock, who um, obviously knew he was going to commit suicide after um, after the attack, he had ordered uh, two last meals from room service, and there's some receipts that are circulated. Of what he ordered. So Ben, would you want to reveal to the audience what Paddock's <clears throat> last meal was, and so we can we can rate it? Okay, so uh, there's uh, a leaked receipt from a, a room service worker. Um, now this shows that Paddock ordered um, a burger, yeah, quite, which is classic, um, a bagel, 
Potato soup. That's, yeah. A bottle of water and two Pepsis. That's pretty boring, isn't it? Yeah. So there you go. Boring guy. Boring meal. Bump stocks. Sorry? Bump stocks, Tom. Very important part of this case. Go on then. Okay. So um, there was a lot of controversy after the shooting because the shooter was found to have used bump stocks on most of the uh, semi-automatic rifles he was shooting down with. Now, I'm not a gun guy, and I know for a fact you're not a gun guy. But uh, looking into this, bump stocks are essentially weapon accessories that allow semi-automatic weapons to fire at rates approaching that of fully automatic weapons. So they basically increase uh, the firing rate um, so that he could obviously release more bullets quicker. I mean, inside the room, he had 23 different guns, some with scopes, others, others with bump stock devices, thousands of rounds of ammunition. Yeah, he had, over, he had 5,000 rounds left. So um, it's pretty um, horrific considering how many, well, how many casualties there already were mm-hmm. and how many he was planning. Yeah, because I mean, from the last few rounds that he started, fi- well, that he was firing on the crowd, there was then kind of a hefty period of time where nothing was going on. Um, so it was, he shot his final uh, rounds at concert goers at ten uh, concert goers at ten fifteen. Yeah, they didn't get into his room until ten fifty seven. No, yeah. eleven twenty even. So that is, uh, that's over an hour. It's an hour and five minutes. So you can't help but think something went, went awry, didn't go to plan. I just, well, uh, they realized that the shots were coming from the floor directly above them at 10, 12, but they don't get into his room until 11, 20. And I hate to use the word currently, but it is currently the uh, deadliest mass shooting in American history, modern American history. But, for the amount of weaponry he had and for how much time he was allowed to just pepper bullets down at them, I'm surprised that it's, you know, I say only, but I'm surprised that uh, the victim count wasn't slightly higher for yes. 58 people. So obviously we mentioned there's there's quite a big uh, window of time between uh, the first shots being fired at, at Jesus Campos and then them actually breaching Paddock's room. Um, there's a few reasons behind that, but uh, during the shooting, police officers were initially confused whether the shots were coming from the Mandalay Bay or the nearby Luxor Hotel. The Luxor's the uh, Egyptian-themed one with the big pyramid with the light popping out of it. Um, or the festival itself um, from within the grounds. There were also uh, multiple false reports of additional shooters on, uh, like you say, at other hotels on the Strip. Officers eventually spotted multiple flashes of gunfire from the middle of the northern side of the Mandalay Bay and responded to the hotel. So they breached, uh, they obviously breached Paddock's suite, found him uh, uh, dead, deceased, expired um, as a result of a self inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Um, As soon as they were able to report that, the immediate response followed was um, the McCarran International Airport, which is the big airport by Vegas, um, adjacent to the shoot. Now, that's the other scary thing. The airport is right next to it. So he was able to shoot bullets at fuel tanks. I think he was thinking like in the movies, yeah. if you hit a fuel tank, it's going to... During the, the shooting, as people were fleeing, uh, approximately 300 people actually entered the uh, the grounds of the, uh, of the airport. Um, uh, as they fled from the the, the bullets. Um, this prompted officials to shut down all four runways. Uh, more than 25 flights were rerouted to ensure that no aircraft would be hit by gunfire. Imagine that. Much of Las Vegas Boulevard was closed um, while the police SWAT teams combed the venue and neighboring businesses. Uh, approximately 2.14 on October 2nd, a state of emergency was declared in Clark County. Early on October 2nd, Sheriff Joe Lombardo identified the suspect as Stephen Paddock. From the shooting, there were 58 casualties, uh, the 59th obviously being over at Mandalay Bay, which is uh, Paddock's suicide. But of the uh, of the 58 victims, 36 uh, were female, 22 were male. 
think the oldest victim was 67 and the youngest was 20. It was determined that all 58 of the uh, victims did die as a result of gunshot wounds. 31 of the uh, 58 were pronounced dead at the scene, while 27 others later succumbed to their wounds at the hospital. There were also 869 people injured, 413, so almost half of them were uh, injured either by gunshot wounds or shrapnel. So it would have been um, October 4th, um, we went to the memorial. Um, and le- you get the news alerts when it happened and 58 people, oh my God, and you see everything and you see all the footage on YouTube and, and none of it seems real. But when we were there and there was a queue to, for people to you know, pay respect, so it was one of the first things we did. That's when it hits you. And you see, I mean, 58 crosses, because there wasn't one for Paddock. They were kind of makeshift crosses. That was that was a long walk. Mm. And, like, you you paid respect to every single cross that you walked past. The hardest part was that there was this huge, like, when I think of America, this is kind of the guy I think of. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Kenny. Such a, such a niche reference. Yeah, yeah, I, know. yeah I, I know. So yeah. we'll pop a, pop a photo up. Yeah. A fictional ca- character called Kenny. But, but that was what he had, like, proper kind of um, big American man. That's that's what I even know. He was just Australian, Kenny. Awful uh, reference point. I mean, no man should be set on fire trying to save one of his shitters, you know. But that that's what he looked like, in, in, and just a big, strong guy, and just in an absolute mess. Um Everyone was in a mess. Um, yeah, I mean, it, that, that's 58 families yeah. ruined. Um, that's the, the, the terrible part. And, and, and not only that, I guess 59 families ruined because although when we go into the, the interview with uh, Eric Paddock, Stephen's brother, who was completely in shock when he decided to give these kind of doorstep interviews, yeah, that's got to be hard for them. Well, totally, yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, they didn't, you know, help him do it. It's not on them at all. I mean, they're answering for his crimes, which is such a, must be such a head, uh, head mess to be in, especially with the newspaper and all the journalists in your face and your front doorstep. And you feel that you, you, you feel like if you weren't going to go out there and talk to them, then it would appear as if you knew something and make you look bad if you didn't do it. But at the same time, you're juggling the fact that I know he was juggling the fact he had to speak to his mum about it and talk to yeah. her about it and explain what's happened to it to yeah. her son. And so, yeah, I mean, for everyone involved, obviously, a heart's go out to all the um, victims and everything like that. It's just, yeah. all in all, it's just a horrible, horrible thing that happened. Yeah, I mean, trying to put yourself in that perspective where you've gone to a concert, you've gone to have a good time in one of the most exciting, um, enjoyable places in the world and for something like this to happen and for people to go to a concert and not to be able to come home. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's horrible. It's am horrific. I, am I right in thinking they actually um, retired, well, at least for a certain period of time, they retired the phrase, uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? Yes, yeah, they did. Yeah, so that's the city's motto. But uh, but yeah, I mean, um, obviously they have the, the surviving uh, witnesses I think uh, a lot of people that were put in hospital um, were visited by Trump, who had been kind of very recently elected at the time. Make a bad thing worse. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> geez. <laughs> but that was it as well, because they tried to um, they tried to put him, uh, one of the motives down is that he was um, anti-Trump, and that's why he shot up a essentially Red Nick uh, music festival. Yeah. But um, he, had, he had built up his uh, armory way before Trump was even anywhere close to being elected. And I even remember, like, election night, like, no one thought you'd actually get it. Yeah. So that was quickly um, blown out of proportion. So we're going to have a quick look at Eric Paddock's uh, interview. Um, basically, he was interviewed the day after. We just don't understand. Uh, it's like I said, an asteroid just fell out of the sky. And we have no reason, rhyme, rationale excuse there's just nothing i mean it's his fault that he did this i mean but i'd like to know where he found the machine gun because that's not something that's that easy to come by i assume Uh, and he's not i mean he has no criminal record he has nothing 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 no affiliations with anything there's nothing i mean we're working with the cops since the first thing trying to you know (laughs) 
trying to understand or, you know, trying to make it do what we could. I, there's just nothing. We got nothing to give you. There's, there's just nothing. He was just a guy. I mean, there's no affiliations. There's no church. There's no religion. There's no politics. There's no anything. My brother just killed 50 plus people. How does that affect me? I'm a little, yeah, I got this headache right now, strangely enough. I mean, uh, we're, our family's huddling together and trying to hope, you know, we're, we're trying to make sense of this. As a brother, you'd imagine he knows him pretty well. And the fact there's no affiliation, in fact, he's in such, he's in such shock. is something that I think is one of the kind of more terrifying things about it. And mm -hmm. um, even the FBI, when they went through and discussed, well, they did like a big investigation into his past and into his how he was, they essentially came to the consensus of there's no clear motive, there's no re they didn't have any red flags, we can't they figure out why he done it, the only thing they kind of associated it with was possibly because he was starting to lose money and he, his health was deteriorating a little bit, but me and you both researched that, didn't find any clear, it wasn't like he was dying of, dying of a disease or a terminal or anything like that, um, he was in a relationship, and it just seems that the scariest thing is just it seems like he just did it because he could. Yeah. He had, the yeah. Money, he had the money and he obviously knew that his reputation there was what it was. He was able to get the room, all that stuff. No, I think um, I think the fact that there is no motive still, what are we now? Almost three years later, I think that was part of his plan. I yeah. think um, he was a very unhappy individual, lonesome individual. And I think he, he was also highly intelligent, highly uh, strategic, analytical thinker. And I think him knowing now that, that people are still looking for answers, you know, almost three years later, is just a final kind of finger in the air. Going on from what you, literally what you just said then, um, the FBI's Las Vegas review panel, Paddock was not seeking to further any religious, social or political agenda through his actions. Oh, yeah, of course, because um, ISIS took, tried to take responsibility immediately as they often do. ISIS claimed responsibility and also claimed that Stephen Paddock was a converted Muslim who carried out the attack on their behalf. They're full of shit. Okay. Steve had nothing to do with any political organization, religious organization, no white supremacist, nothing, as far as I know. Right. They then tried to make him sound um, uh, like a white supremacist, but he's got a Filipino girlfriend. Um, so that was quickly ruled out. Um, the investigators found no manifesto, video, video, suicide note, or any communication uh, related to the planned attack or explaining the reason for him attacking. Yeah, because as well, there was um, the leaked photos. I mean, I don't know who leaked the photos of the the, the suite, the room that, mm. um, that Paddock was in, but people were quick to notice there was like a little notepad next to one on, on one of the uh, like uh, counters in the room but it, um, it looked like it was handwritten notes on it but it was actually just um, his mathematics on the distance the height he was at and yeah. the uh, the ballistics of the bullets Paddock's intention to die by suicide was compounded by his desire to attain a certain degree of infamy via a mass casualty attack and they also said that maybe Paddock was influenced by the memory of his father who was himself a well known criminal mm. so that link to his dad the fact that you know, he didn't know his dad. Maybe he just wanted to get close to his dad. But like you said, the fact that he didn't leave anything there was he wanted everyone to think and wanted to like research and, and probably theorize all these things and make up stuff. And yeah, I mean, for his girlfriend and his brothers to have no idea, I mean, unless they are taking it to the grave with them, um, you'd imagine he would at least have wanted to tell someone. Yeah. Um, at the very least, just uh, so some sort of message was there. But for no, for me, um, he's um, he's a very unhappy guy. He's he's gone to a place where people are often incredibly happy, um, and it's it's just a case of you know people sit, you know wanting to be noticed. Do you think even as a case of him seeing people enjoy themselves, there's something that he hasn't felt in years, and he's taken it. I mean, that's a horrible motive, but. He's taking out on you know people taking out on them, yeah. I mean, yeah, like you said earlier about the the gambling point, like he is taking all of the fun out of his gambling. He's not doing it for 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 fun. He's not doing it for a good time. He's doing it as a job. 
A quite a scary quote from um, a former FBI agent, Joe Navarro, said, perhaps it is helpful to educate ourselves to recognise that we may never know a pure motive, that sometimes predators among us will act out if for no other reason, because they can. I mean, the brother in one of the other videos had said, I hope they, I hope they cut, you know, they do the autopsy and they find a massive tumour in his head. Um, because that would then make sense, you know, if he had a health concern that was ongoing and maybe potentially a fatal health concern then. Yeah. Then, I mean, it doesn't justify it whatsoever, but it... it, it there's an explanation. Yeah. I mean, there's some form of explanation anyway. Yeah. Uh, an interesting thing that came out um, after this, after the attack, a lot of people being interviewed and whatnot about what was happening, what they experienced. A uh, thing that came out was um, 45 minutes before any shots were fired, there was a woman and a partner who were pushing their way to the front of the crowd and they were shouting, you were all going to die tonight. There was a lady who pushed her way forward into the concert venue into the first row and she started messing with another lady and told us that we are all going to die tonight. Do you know why she was saying that? I mean, was this after uh, the shots were fired or? It was about 45 minutes before the shots were actually fired, but then she was escorted out by security. It could just be a wild coincidence in regards to mm. obviously what happened. There um, were there were a few people though that were filmed talking about this lady, so I don't know if it was just a, a coincidence or not. It, it seems bizarre, uh, but multiple claims of a short Hispanic lady forty five minutes before the shooting said that. But then also it said in another one it was an Asian lady. So it seems mm. to be there's it's one of those where. I don't know. I mean, when pe when people get into fights or get thrown out of places, she was ushered away, so she could just been, you know, highly intoxicated and was just shouting things. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just a bit. Those kind of things just seem a lot more eerie after what trans transpired later on that day. For sure, the tattoo conspiracy, which is an interesting one as well, it's not often talked about. But uh, in the photo you mentioned earlier, obviously the, the photo on uh, Paddock's Wikipedia page is his eyes are closed. But if you zoom in, he's actually got a little cross uh, tattooed on his neck. Now, on the, they're, they're, they're fairly easy to access, but I don't recommend doing it if you're uh, faint-hearted. But uh, you can view the, uh, the image of his uh, death scene, um, and there is no no tattoo visible here whatsoever mm. so it's really interesting but um, that, that's one of those conspiracies where it's like well, what's that going to mean it's like mm -hmm. I can't see <laughs> plus you never know when that photo was taken yeah um, and it could, it could literally be a pen and again you, you have to you have to wonder because he he started firing when Jason Aldean took the stage did he sit there and watch the whole concert the whole festival for the whole day so they just didn't <laughs> well he, <laughs> he just yeah. didn't like Jason Aldean well, I'm not putting it all on Jason's plate, but <laughs> no, but that, that's it. So if he's in that room the whole day, what's he doing? I imagine he's just running through it in his head, going over what he's going to do, which gun, when. I mean, that's the thing. It's all speculation. Um, mm -hmm. That's all we can do. You hope that now there's new things in place to stop to prevent these things from happening, but you kind of mm -hmm. kind of think to yourself, what can be put in place to, as I said, as someone with no red flags, all that stuff, how can yeah. you then go? Because, of course, if he had red flags, he wouldn't have been able to get the amount of guns that he got. Well, even then, I think a, 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 an extent of the, the rounds that he'd, uh, the, the, the weapons that he'd stockpiled were purchased illegally as well. But even then, I mean, he's, he's, I assume he's passed the mental health uh, tests and checks that they do for owning a gun in America, um, the, the background check, everything there. So in November 2017, a lawsuit was filed against the Mandalay Bay Hotel for the 450 victims. Um, it was basically stating that the um, hotel showed negligence with the um, with Paddock able to bring so many bags into his hotel room, which, as we've discussed, it was an absurd amount of, of luggage he was allowed to carry in. Yeah, um, but let me stop you there. Are there rules on how many bags you can have in your room? Could you... Well, I think you'd be suspicious about what's being brought in yeah but what rights do they have to check do they have rights to check and search but I mean I'm sure that's changed now but at I don't the know time who's, who side you're on <laughs> I mean I get your point but then if you bring in 20 bags into my hotel I'm saying why have you got 20 bags in there I'm a salesman and what I travel soap soap okay. I want to see some of the uh, bags no Are you... no okay get out of my hotel 
Well, can I have some help? I've got a lot of bags. No. And you're not using the service elevator, you're using the stairs. <laughs> but I tipped him uh, I tipped him a fair amount. So anyway, so that lawsuit was happening, but then MGM, who owned the Mandalay Hotel, countersued, saying that they had no liability for the attack. And that was due to the fact that the the concert goers were on not on ground not owned by the MGM resorts. Um that's messy. So yeah, but what actually happened, there was a settlement reach between MGM and all the and the victims afterwards, uh, of between seven hundred and thirty five to eight hundred million dollars. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Which obviously isn't gonna bring anyone back and it's uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's just it just seems crazy <laughs> MGM counter suing victims. victims it's a tricky one because you i do i do kind of uh, i don't see the side of um before you stop me i don't see the side of um but you think bags <laughs> i'm just on the bags one yeah i need to go back to the bags um so it's not it's not hard to, for him to go back to mesquite i think it was just over an hour and a half or, or whatever from vegas Head back, get a different bag, change your clothes, go in a different... Because all of these hotels as well have multiple entry and exit points. There'll be different bellboys, different um, hotel staff, and it's not hard, you know. I mean, it's... Even him by himself bringing in like six bags at a time. I'd be, if I was, yeah, but how would if you I was not... working there, I'd be like... Oh, so. Didn't you just... And they'd be heavy. Yes, yeah, but... Um... I'm not saying... Like, obviously, this is from... Um, in hindsight... But I mean, he could even make it look like that's a bag he's just gone out with and come back in with. He's gone to play golf. People do that in Vegas. You keep saying the golf thing, but I don't think any of the bags were golf bags. One of and them, I remember, and if we can find it and put it up, that'd be great because it really helped me right now. But um, he's wheeling it. I mean, it's another point. It's not, I'll go back to that point. Um, so it's obviously one of the most heavily surveyed uh, places on the face of the earth. There's 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 video cameras, and that's worried worrying because it's like because it's it still, is a place like that, and you're still able to do it. Yeah. Obviously, it, was, it probably was busier because of the concert and whatnot. But yeah, I mean, still... he's gone for the. I believe that is one of, if not one or two of the nearest hotels to the concert. So the MGM was fairly close as well. Well, the fact that he got to change, he asked to change rooms. Yeah. I mean, imagine that. Imagine if they said no. Imagine if they. How, how many how many bags did he have by that point? Because it must have been like, oh, we're not going to work it out. Yeah, I mean, but twenty odd. Yeah. So then, did he move? Because I know he booked a, the adjacent suite and booked it under the name of Marilu Danley. Oh, okay. But I didn't know he had requested to move rooms. I didn't mm. know that part. It's um, yeah, it's 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 messy. And that covers the case of Stephen Paddock, the Las Vegas shooter. For now, because new things might emerge. Um, there it's might just be been things. three years since. Yeah, so who knows? But currently, no motive. Obviously, hearts go out to the families. I mean, they're still hurting. They still don't have answers. It's uh, yeah, it's a tricky one. It's a really tricky one. It's sad. So there you have it. That's episode one of I Could Murder a Podcast, Stephen Paddock, Las Vegas Shooter. We are going to be uh, bringing out videos like this every week now. So we're covering a few different cases. We've got lots of different things coming up in the pipeline right now. Obviously, we're a, a new channel, a growing channel. We want you to be part of that growth with us. So please, if you have any feedback for us, um, any cases that you'd like us to cover, any suggestions, then uh, please do leave a comment. Please subscribe, like, share. But also, if you want to get a bit more personal, drop us an email. Yeah. I It'll could, be him or me. Yeah, I could murder a podcast at gmail.com. Give That's us an cool. email. Or we've got Patreon going as well. If you want, we're going to be doing more content on there, get, releasing content early, doing different styles of videos. And also, we'll be talking to people a bit more on there. And uh, I basically want to make a little community of um, mm -hmm. murderverts. Murderverts, yeah. It's, uh, it's an exclusive club, guys. So... Uh, <laughs> Please feel free to check it out. You know what I mean? <laughs> You'd be blown away by the content. <laughs> well, You'd be blown away. Oh, what? That's not. It's exclusive content and you really like it. And don't forget to follow us on our socials, Instagram and Twitter. Um, you know, it'll be, we're literally a two-man team, so we'll be able to talk. To, we'll be talking to one of us mm -hmm. via that. And any feedback is welcome. And uh, we hope to see you next week. That's it. So thank you guys so much for watching. We really appreciate it. I know it's been a fairly long episode. Um, sticking with us if you're, 
you're off to bed now, good night. If you're, you're off to start your day now, then have a good day. And uh, anywhere in the middle, all the best to you. I really mean that. Just stay brilliant. That's nice. That's nice. Thank you.